The political crisis in Israel continues after the Knesset voted to rein in the Supreme Court's power. And now the opposition is pledging to ask those same justices to decide on the law's validity. Israel's former prime minister says the country may be headed towards a civil war, while current prime minister Netanyahu sees hopeful signs for reconciliation. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. Just hours after the vote, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu extended a hand to the opposition on national TV. I say to the opposition leaders, you can continue to argue, you can continue to fight, but you can also do something else. You can reach agreements about what to do next. Let's come to an agreement. This is my call to you, and I extend my hand to call for peace and mutual respect within us. Opposition leader Yair Lapid announced he will challenge the legislation in the Supreme Court. That could set up a major showdown between the justices and the legislature in the coming months. In the meantime, demonstrations continued throughout the night in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Protest leaders say their fight has just begun. And former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert told the media that Israel is now entering a period of civil disobedience and even civil war. However, Prime Minister Netanyahu began his message with a hopeful note. He was moved when he saw a video of demonstrators from both sides in a train station, with advocates of judicial reform going up and opponents going down. Despite their differences, they began to reach out and shake hands, as Netanyahu said, not as enemies, but as brothers. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, Jeff Balaban is the Senior Counsel for International and Governmental Affairs with the American Center for Law and Justice. He joins us now from our Jerusalem Bureau to give us some insight on the judicial reform in this battle. So, uh, Jeff, tell us, what, what's at stake here? Why, why do some believe there's a need for reform? Thanks, Gordon. Happy to be with you. So the need for reform goes back, I would say, decades. First of all, what Americans need to understand is Israel lacks any form of written constitution, which already sets up some kind of a contest between the branches. In America, obviously, our constitution creates a balance of power between the branches. Here it doesn't exist. Starting in the late 1980s, the judiciary, led by then Chief Justice Aaron Barak, who, by the way, was a professor of mine at law school in America, started aggregating powers to the court. Now, it's very complicated how they've done it. They've done it many different ways, but some examples should suffice. For example, uh, in America, this is not something the court did. This just exists. In America, we know the president, the executive branch, selects, nominates judges to the Supreme Court. Then it goes to the legislature, who has to confirm them. And then finally, they sit on the court. But the court doesn't choose. Here, it's the opposite. Here, there's a committee. And because you need at least seven members of, of, of the committee of nine, and three of those members are on the court. The court always has a veto power over who sits there. So the court itself self-perpetuates a set of ideas by bringing in the people that are aligned. Combine that with a doctrine called reasonableness, which was what just passed yesterday. It was a slight tweak to that. It's no standards whatsoever. There's no constitution that tells you what's right or what's wrong. These unelected judges who self-perpetuate just can decide to nullify the acts of the democratically elected branch of the government. And that's the problem, one of many problems that are seeking to be solved by reform. Isn't this doctrine of reasonableness something that the Israeli Supreme Court essentially invented on their own? Uh, is, this, is there anything in law passed by the Knesset that would allow them to do that? Uh, you're right, Gordon. It was, it's, the word reasonableness actually exists in other countries, for example, in British law. And what Barack did as the president of the court, and he did this using many terms that appear even in our Bill of Rights and our Constitution, in some of our most storied and important uh, judicial history, they take these words, but then they use it to mean different things. So reasonableness here literally means whatever appeals to a judge or a judge. Whatever the judge believes is right, that's the standard. So there's no standard whatsoever. And again, they're unelected which is why each side is claiming the, the mantle of pro-democracy. That's really what's going on here. They're saying it's, it's anti-democratic, meaning the pro-reformers, the anti-reformers, are saying it's anti-democratic to vest too much power in the elected branches, and the elect, because there's nothing that stops them. There's no constitution. The elected branches are saying, you're taking too much power, you're not even elected. And so they're trying to find a middle ground here, but unfortunately, instead of 
simply discussing the law in a reasonable way, it's becoming a big social disruptor. Can, can you give us some examples of how the Supreme Court used reasonableness to overrule uh, the Knesset or overrule the prime minister? Sure. I mean, I'll give you an example even more egregious. There have been cases, I'm aware of at least three, where there were elected officials, I think there were mayors, that were elected locally. And after they were elected, a judge decided, I think it was unreasonable for this person to be allowed to be a candidate, and therefore they're no longer the mayor. And there's no one to appeal that to. They're literally <laughs> not allowing elected officials to be elected officials. This is the choice of the people. This is something, you know, we use the word court, Supreme Court, but it's a completely different beast. It's a completely different power than we're used to in America. Well, we're heading for a showdown because now the, the law that Knesset just passed yesterday saying uh, we need to rein in reasonableness, that law is now going in front of the su same Supreme Court that created the ruling in the first place. So what's your prediction of, of how this is going to turn out? Well... Uh, my prediction is that it's going to be turn out to be a big political battle because you're right, 100 percent correct. There is no standard for reasonableness. There are already petitions to strike down the law. I don't think they've used the word reasonableness, but there are petitions to render uh, the prime minister incapacitated uh, because they don't like what he did. There is the, the same way they tried to do that, I believe, with President Trump. They use the word incapacitated in, in a different context. There are, uh, there's a petition to strike it down for being anti-democratic. Well, what does that mean? Both sides are claiming anti-democracy. In the end, it's up to the court to make its own decision based on what it wants. If there were any rationality, if there were any honesty here, the court would do what it's been doing to Netanyahu, which is say, we have to recuse ourselves. We can't make this decision by ourselves. It's highly unlikely they will do that. They have been grasping more and more power for decades. It's unlikely they'll walk away from this fight. So it will play out, unfortunately, by those who are trying to gin up a political fight in the public. Well, the fight in the public has gotten really extreme with uh, calls that there's some kind of dictatorship being created. Uh, I'm frankly amazed at some of the commentary from American politicians. Uh, how, how deep does this division go and, and what's really fueling it? I think there are multiple layers here that need to be considered. As we see in America, and this really is a good analogy because people can see this in our own experiences in the United States, that there are words that are used to mean they're opposite, to gin up public fear. So we see in America, the left will use words like democracy or human rights when they mean just the opposite, freedom, when they mean the opposite. That's what's happening here. The anti-reformers are using words like democracy to mean it's very opposite. And so... At the base, you have well-meaning people, well-meaning Israelis, as you have well-meaning Americans, who they, they believe it. They don't assume bad faith. You have the media playing a role as egregious here, if not more so, than you do in America with pushing a narrative, terrible narratives. You have leading politicians who you see, it looks like they're trying to undermine the coherence and cohesiveness of Israeli society, as you see them in America doing there. And so it seems like the same playbook. And unfortunately, there are well-meaning people. And, you know, in the intro to this, we saw a video, which was very telling, where you saw the protesters, the people on the street, not the politicians, the people on the street who feel very strongly about this. And they're out in public, and they were going, some, you know, half of them were going to protest the reforms, half were going to support the reforms. But as Netanyahu pointed out, they were going with, in a sense of brotherhood and unity, because what they cared about was this country and this people. But it looks like the ones who are against reform are pushing the opposite. They're pushing this notion of civil war. They're going to the rest of the world and saying, you shouldn't invest in Israel. You should ostracize Israel. Israel's becoming a dictatorship. None of that is true. Well, it's concerning to me as an interested observer uh, uh, that um, the re reservists are now saying they're going to refuse to be called up. I mean, is the security of the state at risk? It's deeply, deeply concerning, Gordon. You're right. They're... The, Opposition to these reforms have crossed a number of red lines. One of these red lines, for example, is it has been the practice of all the pilots in the Israeli Air Force, and this is not a, an order, this is not a command, this is just their practice. After their mandatory service, they come back once a week to fly, so they're constantly in battle readiness. And because it's not an order, they're saying, well, you know what, we've been volunteering to do this, we don't like your policies and we're not going to show up anymore and you can't force us to. That's deeply disturbing. Others are saying they won't come and serve in the army. Yes, it's deeply disturbing. And 
I'm afraid to say it's, it's the politicization of this coming from one side. I'm not saying the other side isn't political, but the one side that seeks to really undermine cohesion, cohesion in this society, and they're doing it by really ginning up fear. Again, I think the people who are fearful are genuinely fearful, but I think that the people behind it are playing on their emotions and they're lying to them. Well, tomorrow night begins a Jewish uh, holiday. It's called, uh, holiday is probably the wrong word. It's an observance, the ninth of Ah, And then it's a time of repentance and mourning. And I think this is definitely a time to call a sacred as assembly. Uh, how, how has this now become part of the debate? Well, you know, the, the Knesset is going out of session. And that's why they were forced to do it now, or it would have taken more months and caused more disruption in society. But the truth is, people like me, who are observant and who believe, are deeply concerned that this is taking place during this week. This, this period of mourning, it's a period of national mourning. Every year, it commemorates the worst calamities in Jewish history. It's the anniversary of when the spies came back and spoke ill of the land of Israel. It's the anniversary of the destructions of both of the Jewish temples. It's the anniversary of so many calamities throughout history. There are those who say, and I believe this is accurate, it's the anniversary of the date that the final solution was actually signed into law or accepted as a policy by the Third Reich. So from ancient times to today, this has been a period where we, where we actually mourn as though we're mourning an immediate family member's loss. We're mourning the loss not just of the temples, but of unity among the Jewish people, which is what has always caused the greatest calamities. We, again, we literally now, we're, we're living in a moment as if we've lost an immediate family member. We don't shave, we don't eat certain foods, we don't drink certain things, and then this culminates tomorrow night, on this day, the ninth day of Av, on this worst day, and we mourn. And it's a day that reminds us what's missing in our lives. I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, I shouldn't. It's a very emotional time, and we're concerned, deeply concerned, that this separation among Jews, this disunity among Jews, is happening at this moment. I could just say that I'm hopeful that the side, you know, Netanyahu, the pro-reform side, I, I, I noticed this, it's interesting, they're calling for unity. The pro, the anti-reform side, they're calling for civil war. They're calling for people to ostracize the Jews. I'm hoping that we can turn this moment, I'm praying that we turn this moment into a moment where we come together despite our divisions, and once again, behave as a Jewish nation or Jewish people who face these things together and know that our end has to be united. Well, Jeff, our prayers are with you. And it's, it's certainly fine to get emotional about this because I literally think the Jewish state is at risk. If, if you, these divisions continue, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I hope that the observance of the divisions, the horrors that have happened to the Jewish people bring you back together again. But I have every confidence that God will keep his covenant with the Jewish people and you will make it through this. Jeff, thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. And, and thanks for being with us today.